Hello there and welcome back to Backyard Ballistics. Once again, we're not really in a backyard and at some stage I'll explain why, but today we're at the shooting range I normally use for filming and for my job. That's because I want to show you the ingenious solutions needed to build a safe shooting range. You see, most of those who get into guns and shooting sports often only focus on buying the actual guns, ammo and accessories, but all of this is not enough for sports shooting or training. Actually, it's the least expensive part. The fact that guns are intrinsically dangerous, even at distances up to 3 miles from the shooter, makes finding a good place for their safe use quite challenging in most situations. Now, especially for those of you who live in areas with low population densities, one could find a place that is far enough from anyone or anything, or you could shoot against a large enough bullet catcher, being extra careful not to point the gun anywhere else, but it's easy to realize that it would be a far from perfect solution. Similar considerations apply to many other sports and activities which require an infrastructure to be enjoyed at their best. If for example you like swimming, you could go for the sea, a lake or even a fishing pond, but most people would rather enjoy the comfort of a swimming pool. With guns it's not just a matter of comfort, but also of safety, both inside and outside the range. Now, while building a tennis court or a basic football field is pretty straightforward, a shooting range requires an accurate design. Let's do a quick tour of this range to see the different solutions one by one. This is the range where I do most of my work in filming, and of course it's not mine, but since a little over one year I'm in charge of the maintenance and upgrades, and as you'll see there's still a lot to do. The structure was built in the 60s, upgraded in the early 90s, but since then it was never really maintained properly and was in very bad shape. Luckily a couple of years ago there was a drastic change in management and the range is now slowly being upgraded. Anyway, as we enter the door of one of the shooting booths, we encounter the shooting stalls, six in this particular case. From each of them, a shooter fires at the target in front of him at various distances, in this particular case up to 25 meters. Most of the bullets are caught by the large embankment you see behind the target, which I'm now going to show properly. To reach the bottom of the range, we use this auxiliary and moldy corridor, which as you guessed hasn't been restored yet, except for the doors at the bottom, which are safety critical. Once the door is open, you can directly walk in front of the targets. Behind them, you see where 95% of the bullet goes. This is the simplest and cheapest bullet stopper possible, a soil embankment. It also requires very little maintenance, since the hole made by each bullet naturally closes behind it. About once a year, the topsoil is cooped up and sifted to remove the bullets. I'm now going to climb over the embankment to show a few additional details and what lies beyond. As you see, it's quite a steep hill and I'm struggling a bit getting to the top, but finally here we are. Even though there is absolutely no chance that anything could pass through this much soil, a one foot thick concrete wall closes the back of the range. The embankment doesn't rest on it, since that would exert pressure on the wall, requiring it to be stronger. Instead, it's usually cheaper to simply make the range slightly longer to accommodate the natural slope of the soil. The last thing that should be noted is a strip of quarter inch AR500 steel placed at the target's height as a final redundant safety measure. I told you that about 95% of the bullets goes into the embankment, the main bullet stopper, but where does the other 5% go? It can't get out of the range, that's for sure. The whole purpose of the building is to prevent any bullet from leaving it. Also, that 5% is the amount we worry the most, and the most expensive to protect against. You see, the bullet stopper of a shooting range is like the front arm of a battle tank. There's practically no chance of getting through it, it's the part that is designed to take hits. On the other hand, hits coming from less common directions, even though less likely, are those susceptible of causing more damage. Now that we're back in the shooting booth, let's see what this means. Basically, from the shooting point, no matter where the gun is pointed, the bullet must remain inside the range. And this must be true for any point inside the shooting bay. In other words, no matter your position, you must never see the sky. So let's pretend that the camera is the gun, and I'm moving it around the perimeter of the shooting bay. As you can see, no matter the position, you can never see the sky. Apart from the embankment, the view is limited either by the walls of the range, the ground, the roof, which is purposely lengthened in the direction of firing, or by that baffle, which really deserves a closer look. It's basically just a brick wall suspended on three pillars and a couple of beams and has the purpose of intercepting abnormally high trajectories, but there are a few interesting aspects I want to highlight. First, the lowermost couple inches get frequently hit by inexperienced shooters, so the concrete beam is placed a little higher than that, and so my R500 steel hanging down does the dirty work. Even the concrete beam, which sits higher, is protected by AR steel, since getting load-bearing framework destroyed over time tends to be quite unpleasant. And what about the wood? It's certainly not there for stopping bullets, but for capturing shrapnel and debris. 
whenever a bullet impacts a hard surface, it gets broken into shrapnel that is still moving quite fast and represents a danger, mostly for the eyes. That's why any hard surface situated in the shooting area must be covered with a softer material capable of catching bullet fragments. And this includes the roof, floor and walls of the shooting range. Some might argue that guns should be kept pointed in a safe direction at all times, in which case no bullet impact inside the actual booth will ever occur. However, the basic rule of safety engineering tells that given enough time, anything that can potentially happen will happen an infinite number of times. Or in other words, the designer can never trust the user, which is why the range is designed thinking that from the shooting position, shots could be fired in any direction. So let's get back to the anti-ricochet cladding. Most of the times, wood is the most cost-effective solution. Since it is essentially there just to catch fragments, cheaper forms like the OSB you see here are typically used. It is placed in front of the hard surface so that a couple inch gap is left between the steel and the wooden board. In case a bullet was to hit the wall, it would pierce the wood, smash against the hard surface and get broken into small pieces that remain trapped in the gap. Each and every wall from the shooting base onwards, including the roof, is clad in wood with a gap in between. You just don't see it here because of the acoustic panelling. We're lucky though, since exactly at the time of filming this, the acoustic cladding of the other stand is being renewed, so you can actually see what's beneath it. Also, the wooden lining of the lower roof was damaged and had to be replaced, which is why we're seeing the actual ceiling there. Anyway, wood is good for ranges, cheap, abundant and easy to work with, but unfortunately there's one spot when its use is not allowed, and that's the floor, both of the shooting soles and in front of them, and there's a very valid reason for that. In the past, many accidents have happened where unburnt powder falls to the ground and infiltrates between wooden boards, piling up underneath them where it is practically impossible to clean and get it removed. If you've watched my video on the short barrel 22 Magnum, you know what I'm talking about. I estimated that on average each customer of this range leaves behind about one gram of unburnt powder every time he comes to shoot, which for a commercial range like this one is quite a lot, and unless constantly removed, dangerous amounts of it can accumulate. Here's some footage I took a couple of years ago of this same range, right before I started being in charge of the maintenance. Some old management had the brilliant idea of placing some highly flammable and impossible to clean carpeting in front of the shooters, right where most of the powder accumulates. You can see me sweeping around literal pounds of the stuff. If some of the unburnt powder was to infiltrate below wooden boards, in a few years we would be standing on a disaster waiting to happen. And what is worse is that when it catches fire, it doesn't look dangerous at all. Just a big puff of smoke, but that smoke contains unusually high levels of carbon monoxide, meaning that the shooting area quickly transforms into a gas chamber. Solution, no wood or gaps in the floor. But no hard surfaces either, so what do we use? Most of the time, rubber. Using an appropriate thickness of flame retardant rubber flooring, applied directly to the concrete slab, allows catching the fragments of a bullet accidentally fired towards the ground. Actually, here you can see one. This wasn't an accident though, but the result of the approval test performed many years ago. In front of the shooter you see a similar rubber flooring used, but this time a concrete slab is to be avoided to prevent ricochets. The best solution is using mechanically stabilized sand. Basically, these interlocking honeycomb plastic structures are placed on the level ground, filled and compacted with sand and covered with a thick rubber flooring. The result is a composite floor which feels very solid when walking over it, but lets a bullet go through with great ease and safe repairs after. All of these while being over 95% sand by weight, which is the ultimate fireproof material. For the first time in this video I mentioned ricochets and the need to avoid them. You see, what I described it now would be enough to stop any direct heat, but wouldn't be enough to stop ricochets if it wasn't for these last two elements, side baffles and mounds. These two are there just for this purpose. You see, any surface, even the softest, has a critical ricochet angle. If the angle between the bullet direction and the surface is lower than the critical value, the bullet will ricochet instead of penetrating through. The softer and lighter the material, the lower the critical angle will be, meaning that it will have a lower tendency to make bullets ricochet. For example, for water the critical value is about 10 degrees, so only bullets hitting the surface at very narrow angles will ricochet, while harder and denser materials can cause ricochets with much greater angles. Once again, we see why any hard surface has to be clad in something softer, typically wood. But even wood and soil have a critical ricochet angle of about 30 degrees, much larger than that of water, so in order to avoid bullets keeping out of the range, we need to make sure that from any of the shooting points, no surface rests at less than 35 degrees. Both the walls and the ground of the range, if left flat, would violate this condition. 
for the walls. What we do is to place these additional baffles, simple brick walls clad in wood angles so that any incoming bullet will hit them with an angle larger than 35 degrees. On the ground we do exactly the same, but it's even easier since we just have to pile up these mounds. Now, on some small surfaces ricochets can still happen, for example on top of the mounds, so for those regions we have to make sure that any of the possible ricochets will hit another surface inside the range, in which case the ricochet is considered acceptable. If instead there is a chance for some of the bullets to ricochet out of the range, the geometry needs to be modified to compensate for that. Anyway, that's all I wanted to tell you today. Once again, a huge thanks goes to my patrons, which as usual are all listed here. Thank you all for watching, subscribe if you'd like to see more, and I'll see you next time, bye!